In the 1950s, the US Air Force set out to move into the jet age, and the result was the incredible Century series of aircraft. And we're going to be looking at them today on the Damcasters. Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bone. The Century series was never an official name for the series of aircraft. It was a PR term, essentially, that came up from the F-100 through to about the F-110, which never really happened anyways. So while we were out at the Pima Air and Space Museum, I had an aircraft designer with me in Joe Welding, and we went round and had a look at the almost complete collection of Century Series aircraft there at Pima. And we have to thank Pima for their incredible support in making the Damcasters happen and for letting us basically run around and film loads of stuff while we're out there. Pima is quite simply a remarkable museum. Constantly, there is new things going on display. The Saab Gripen is just getting its new coat of paint in the restoration shed as well. So there's all kinds of amazing things happening. So please do head over to www.pimaair.org to find out all the latest happenings and the latest aircraft that are going on display. We're looking forward to the arrival of the Martin Mars later this year as well. It's Mars Philippines. So it's going to be good. And we'll be covering it here on the Damcasters. But with Joe Welding with us, who we've had on before when we've talked about his Adam aircraft and other things too, it was really interesting to be able to walk around these aircraft, starting at the F-100 or the quick detour to the P-80, and start delving into how these aircraft pushed US fighters to higher and higher speeds. So let's head out to a very sunny, very warm February day at the Pima Air and Space Museum with the fantastic Joe Welding. So, Joe, why are we standing out here in the blazing heat next to a North American F-100 Super Sabre? Well, so this museum, the Pima Air Museum, has got a complete set of what's called Century Series fighters, which are pretty unique. Um, I love the, the, the lineage and the history of, of these fighters. I will start by saying they were very unsuccessful in general. <laughs> um, these were built at a time, uh, you know, some people call these a first gen fighter, a jet fighter, some a second gen, depending on how you want to go with that nomenclature. Uh, but these were all built in the very early 50s um, and essentially uh, all for the U.S. Air Force and essentially with sort of an unlimited check from the U.S. government. So the, the, there were um, six Century Series fighters that were built, so the 100 through the 107. One is missing, the 103. We'll talk about that later. It's kind of a fascinating story in itself. Um, but these were all essentially built at the same time. The first three or four were all built within like one or two years of each other. The later ones a few years later, but all the whole set were built within like five years of each other. And I think of the five or six, sorry, I think there's five different manufacturers represented. So essentially the, the Air Force went out to all these manufacturers and there are names you would know from, from World War II, like North American and Republic, Lockheed, et cetera. Uh, they basically went out and said, build us fighters. We don't care what they are, you know, as high performance as possible. It was not a competition really, because the Air Force ended up buying and fielding every one of these fighters. Um, so they're pretty fascinating. And what to me was fascinating, they're at a time when there was just a lot of very rapid evolution in jet aircraft. Jet engines were relatively new, uh, you know, just four or five years old at this point. Uh, they were basically started right after uh, the, the sound barrier had been broken. So this is really the first generation in America of supersonic jets. And so there was a lot to be learned. And because of that, a lot of mistakes were made. A lot of, unfortunately, test pilots and operational pilots died in these airplanes because they were a handful to fly and had a lot of flaws. But that said, I think the engineering story and the development, the design story of them is really fascinating to look at some of the details as you go through the, the lineage of airplanes. Okay, so we're going to look at things like the wings and the intakes. And dear viewer, or if you're listening to this, you're missing out, it is super bright. So I've even got a polarizing filter on this. So if things just look a bit washed out, it's because it is hot. Anyways, yeah. so let's start with wings. Joe, take yeah. it away. Here, what's, you know, I think a lot of people will know the F-100 from those crazy footages of it on Afterburner barely getting airborne. Yes. Let's delve into this. What is, in, I'm not going to say special on any of these airplanes. 
what's interesting here with, with the F100? Yeah, so the F100 is called the Super Sabre. It, it is really no commonality with the original F86 Sabre, other than it is somewhat of a similar airplane as far as the technology and the design. So the F86 was, of course, the first swept wing, production swept wing fighter that uh, essentially started out as a straight wing fighter uh, at the time of, the, right at the time of the development before they built the first one was when uh, information was coming back from, as, as the Allies swept across Europe and overran some research facilities and wind tunnels, got a bunch of documents on swept wing technology and that directly went back and went into the F-86, which really explains why it was uh, a, a step ahead of most of its contemporaries having that swept wing. So that's the F-86. The F-100 basically took those same ideas and took them a step further, which from a speed standpoint was a great thing. Um, and we can talk here in a second about swept wings and what they do. They are great for going fast. They're great for reducing transonic drag, so the drag you get right before you hit the sound barrier, as well as after you break through the sound barrier and you're flying at low sub or slow supersonic speeds. Everything else about swept wings is terrible. <laughs> they're hard to build, they're heavy, and most importantly, they make a lot of problems for the wing and for the aircraft at low speeds. So they, the, the flow doesn't like to flow over them in the same way it does for a, a nice straight wing airplane. There's something like a, it's a Gen 0 0.5 shooting star behind it. Yeah, exactly. Lucky, quickly knocked together. Yep. We're, we're only talking about 10 years, aren't we? It's not even that. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, yeah, not even that, like probably eight years. So essentially, again, the wing is similar to an F-86, but there's a couple big differences. One, it has more sweep. I think this airplane has 45 degrees of leading edge sweep. I don't remember exactly what an F-86 has, but high 30s or 40, but that little bit starts to make a big difference. The other, probably the bigger change is this is a much thinner wing. So the F-86 was not really designed to be a supersonic airplane. The later versions of it, certainly in a dive, could go supersonic. This airplane was designed from the very get-go to be a supersonic airplane. So the wing, so the thickness of the wing right here, so this, this dimension divided by the cord is quite a bit thinner than a F-86. And the leading edge is much sharper because of that as well. It's not sharp per se, we'll get to that here in a moment, <laughs> um, but it's much sharper than a, than a F-86. And those two things, that amount of sweep and that sharpness makes them essentially stall not very well. And so your, your reference earlier to seeing these things kind of hanging in the air, um, what a lot of people refer to as the saber dance was the, the real Achilles heel of this airplane. So when they got slow, this sweep, what happens is, um, well, first of all, let's talk about what the advantages of this are. So a swept wing, the air comes in straight, it's hard to see on a, on a camera here, but the, the air comes in you know, parallel to the fuselage. And then this leading edge presents an angle to that airflow. And there's two things that happen on that. One is that, that uh, geometric change basically makes the wing fly like it's flying at a slower Mach number. So the, the drag rise you get due to high Mach numbers are lessened with a swept wing. And the more you sweep it, the more of that effect you get. Um, the, the other problem with that though is as you get flow coming over the wing, some of that flow tends to go outboard on the wing as well. And that outboard flow is really what wrecks all the other qualities of, of a flying wing. So, Sorry to interrupt, is that yeah. why, like on the MiG-15, we see the fences? That's exactly right. There, there's actually two reasons for that, but, but that, that um, span-wise flow is a big reason for that. A lot of F-100s have those wing fences exactly for that reason. I don't, I'm not an expert on F-100s. I'm not sure why this one doesn't have it. I think certain variants had them and certain didn't, but, but that's exactly what those fences are for. So what happens is as you get that span-wise flow, the, the flow just the more it goes outboard, the, the gnarlier it gets, for lack of a better term. So what's the technical term is the boundary layer gets thicker. The boundary layer is this region of flow that sort of sticks to the wing, but it doesn't stick very good, so it stalls easier. And so you get tip stall on the airplane, and tip stall is terrible because then you lose your airline control and you have no ability to control the airplane anymore. Uh, so that was the, the, one of the major problems with kind of this wing design and flying slow. Two other problems that kind of crept in on this airplane is this was one of the first airplane to have fully hydraulic flight controls. Um, and we talked about that a little bit on the other day on the B-52. In this era of the early 50s, hydraulics were a very new thing to be putting on airplanes and they were not very reliable. Uh, so putting your primary flight controls with hydraulics had, had massive challenges and massive failures. Because one of those challenges was feel. Back feel was, was, yeah, so not only failures, it was also feel. So 
all the feel, so on a, on a typical slow airplane, you get feedback through the stick, meaning the, what the ailerons are doing, what the wing is doing, the pilot can feel that through the stick. When you make it hydraulic, fully hydraulic, there's no feedback anymore. So you've got to manufacture that feedback with springs and bob weights and stuff like that. And the industry didn't really know how to do that at that stage. So they were putting in what they thought would be right, but the pilots weren't responding to that in the right way that they were used to when it was natural. And so that was another problem. The third problem is the early jet engines, very much at their infancy as well, and they had really slow reaction times. So if you got down on landing and got underpowered, um, kind of behind the power curve, as they say, and you went to throttle up, you're not getting thrust within a second or two. It might take five or more seconds for that engine to spool back up and give you thrust. And five or seven seconds in an airplane like this that's already on the verge of being out of control is way too long. So all of those things related to this airplane being just a complete handful to fly if you didn't fly it exactly by the numbers and you got even just a little bit too slow. So let's get around to the pointy end. Yeah. This aircraft has a unique feature compared to the rest of the 76, doesn't it? Yes. So let's actually start right here. We're going to back up one step. So this... Johnson's quickie. Yeah, so this is the P-80. Um, this airplane is, was, was developed in, during World War II, so the mid-40s, as a completely subsonic airplane. At this point, you know, supersonic was a dream, but it was years away from, from being reality. So this is the type inlet you see on many... Um, airplanes of this era that were not designed to be supersonic. This one happens to be a dual inlet, so one on either side. And I should say inlet or intake. Intake tends to be the more British term for this. In America, we call these inlets essentially the same thing. Um, so this is split in half. An F-86 has essentially the same shape, but it's just right on the nose. And so this is what's called a pitot inlet, which means it's sort of like a pitot probe, which is measuring um, total pressure at the front of the airplane. The air is just flowing straight into this. And on a subsonic airplane, this works great. It, it flows in, um, it gets to the engine, and, and it goes. Uh, airliners, business jets all have this same style inlet today. And as a subsonic airplane, this works great. So that, that's why we see this sort of semi semicircular one across Hunter, at yep. sort of V-shaped ones as well through yes. the sort of early 50s period. That's right. So they all, I mean, there will be subtle differences, but they all essentially look like this because a nice rounded shape doesn't have corners. There's no interference drag because of that. Two other features I'll point out that you see in almost all of this type inlet. One is there's a radius here. And what that does is at high speeds, the airflow is coming in here at high rates and going just straight back into the engine. When you first go to take off, you go to high throttle, you're not moving it has to suck in a massive amount of air into this intake. And it doesn't all come just from straight from the front. Like if I was standing here and this thing was at full power, like I would be at, at, at um, the possibility of getting sucked into that. Cause it's literally drawing air in from all this whole space to get enough air into there. And so as this air comes over and starts to accelerate, it needs to wrap around this corner. And that's why you see these nice big generous radiuses on pitot style inlets like this that are on subsonic aircraft. So we'll go over to the 100 next, but one other feature I'll talk about real quick because it's really obvious on this one. This is what's called a boundary layer splitter. So when you have an inlet like this that's some ways back on the fuselage, we talked about boundary layer earlier. As you come off the nose, the air as it moves back here is going to be getting, a region of airflow is going to be getting thicker and thicker that essentially is like sticking to the side of the airplane. As that airflow sticks, it slows down and it's losing a lot of energy. And a jet engine, the way it works is it takes in air and it adds more energy to it and throws it out the back at a higher speed, higher velocity, which is where you get your thrust. If you're taking air into this that's already being slowed down, you're kind of defeating your purpose. <laughs> so almost all jet engines will be off, separated off of any kind of a body that they're next to, such that that low energy layer of air can basically get sucked away and, and spit out outboard somewhere. In this case, there's some louvers right here where that air that comes in there is just gonna be ejected here rather than going into the engine. So a very common feature on almost any airplane on a modern airline or you your engine nacelles are just set off of the wing or set off of the fuselage. They don't have something that looks like this, but it essentially is the same effect. The time you don't need this is when you have your inlet right on the front of the airplane because there's nothing in front of it. There's no boundary layer. Which, interestingly, is the F-100. One other change, though, is, again, we were talking there about a subsonic airplane and its need for those big radiuses so the air can flow around at, at low speeds and at no speed. The problem with that big radius is when airflow hits it, and let's pretend this, this pitot boom here is that lip, 
when air hits this supersonically, you get this big bow shock wave that comes off of that. And that causes its own problems for losing energy in the airflow. So when you get to an inlet that's specifically designed to be supersonic, you don't want those big curved inlets. You want something that's relatively sharp, which is what we see right here. Um, that's sort of a double-edged sword because supersonically, that's great. You get the air that just kind of hits that relatively sharp edge as sort of a knife edge. It either goes in or it goes out, and it doesn't get that big bow wave, that big shock wave on there. Um, the problem with this is, is at low speeds, you get the problem we were talking to over there. The air that wants to come in out of the side here hits this and wants to separate. And in fact, it very much does. Why an airplane like this can get away with this is the engine is back probably 20 feet from here. So even though it separates right here, it can kind of remix in that duct and get back to an okay position once it gets to the engine. Because it's going to be mixing and then split either side of the cockpit as it goes down to the engine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And for these airplanes, it was all about top speed. So they were willing to sacrifice some performance at very low speeds or at takeoff conditions in order to maximize their efficiency at, at high speed. Uh, one other thing we can talk about here, we'll get into more of this when we get to the later airplanes. Again, a pitot inlet. So the way this works supersonically is when the air comes in here, there will actually be a shock wave inside of this inlet that's called a normal shock. And it's called a normal shock because it's just square to the front of the inlet. And as the air comes through that shock wave, it slows down to subsonic speed because jet engines can't deal with supersonic flow going into them. And the, the geometry, the shaping of that duct is all very carefully designed to, to make that happen correctly. That's really important. Now, these airplanes, you know, I think this airplane had a top speed of like Mach 1.25, so it's supersonic, but not by much. At that speed, this type of inlet works great. The problem with the pitot inlet is as you go up in speed, the faster your Mach number is, that the loss you get going through that normal shock wave goes up a lot. And so if you're flying like Mach 2, if you have a normal shock inlet, you're probably losing 50% of the uh, energy of that airflow going through an inlet like this, which means you have like 50% smaller engines, um, which is a big deal. So this worked great in this era. As soon as you start to try to go faster, you need a different style of inlet. And we'll talk about that when we get to the F-104. Before we get there, we have Convair's attempt, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. So. He's very much always the one of the Century Series, which if you were to say to a kid, build me a supersonic fighter, yeah. throw me a supersonic fighter, you get something. This is what you get. Like yeah. And man, does it look good. <laughs> It's, the story is not as quite as fortunate, but man, does it look good. Um, real quick, we should note, so we went F-100, F-102, where's the F-101? There actually is one here somewhere. Um, we'll skip over that because to me, actually, it's right here behind us. Wow, to me, it's less interesting. It's wing design. It's, it's less interesting for this story that we're talking about. I'm gonna let those beautiful F-18s pass. Yep, there we go. My country doing their thing. I think I'm getting so bright. <laughs> so the F-80 or F-101 has a wing design, I would say very similar to the F-100. Its inlets are similar as well. They are bifurcated, but they're somewhat sharp like the F-100 has. Um, the big thing about the F-101 is it's a two-engined uh, airplane, twin, um, and it's, it was basically made for longer range uh, bomber escort, which turned out not to be a thing. Later is used for reconnaissance and other, other missions. But again, as far as this like being having very unique features, it's kind of similar to the F-100. So back to the F-102 then. So the F-102 is, um, I think, fascinating. So made by uh, Convair, drastically different wing design. So this has what's called a delta wing, which means it's also a swept wing, but it's a really swept wing. So it's, it's leading edge angle is like 60 degrees back from, from straight. And it looks um, like a triangle. It's got a, a straight leading edge. It's a tailless aircraft, so all of the controls are on the wing, but there's not a separate tail, uh, horizontal at least. Um, similar to like a Mirage. Mirage is a very similar design. So the way this works, actually, let's go over here because we're going to talk about the F-106 in just a second. So a wing like this produces a very different... Oh, coming into land. A wing like this produces a very different mechanism for producing lift than the wing that we just saw in the F-100 at low speeds. At high speed, they're actually not a whole lot different. You've got just some area that's cutting through the air and, and producing lift. At low speed, what happens is you get 
this is a reasonably sharp leading edge. It's not sharp, sharp, but it's, it's getting sharper. And you can see there's some camber to this, some under curvature. What happens is at high speed with that much sweep, as the air comes over this, it makes this big vortex. And so think of a vortex like a horizontal tornado that really just spins up in this really high speed core that kind of is above the wing. And that high speed creates a really low pressure region around the whole top surface of this wing. And it's kind of this magical thing that's really stable and it works really well at very low speeds. And then once you get faster and the angle of attack comes down, that kind of flow phenomena goes away and it flies more like a regular wing. And then once you're flying supersonic, it's a whole nother regime, but it works really well. So generally speaking, it's a pretty interesting way to make a, a wing design, but it's very different than what we, we just talked about from that mechanism. A lot of successful airplanes have used this, you know, most notably Concorde has this style wing, slightly different in that Concorde doesn't have a straight leading edge like this, but it's a similar concept, it very much gets vortex flow. Um, SR-71 is one, even the F-15 has, has a, a, a essentially a delt wing like this, although the F-15 has a tail. So here we can see these wing fences we were talking about. Well, this plane does have that same problem of with that much sweep, you get spanwise flow and generally spanwise flow is never good. Um, you said it was two things, to stop the bleed, what was the, the second? Oh, so the second one is um, uh, shock waves. So at certain airplanes, and the MiG-15 that you were referring to is a big one on this, you can basically get a shock wave that comes off this inboard section and it fans out as it goes back and it can really wreck the airflow over this wing. And so the MiG-15, um, this fence is like this tall, like it is ridiculously tall. And that's why, because when you're dealing with a boundary layer, the boundary layer is not very tall. So you don't need this fence to be very big to, to stop it. When you're talking about a shock wave, it's gotta be really tall so it doesn't expand outboard and, and wreck everything. Okay. I think these on this airplane are just for boundary layer, but there might be some shock effect there too. Cool. So another interesting one on this, let's walk down here toward the wingtip. You can see this a little at the, at the root side, but you can see it really big here. Look at this curvature. So you can kind of see my arms here, like this is level here and this is drooping down, I don't know, 30 degrees or more right there. So this is what's called conical camber. And so what that means is if you look at the leading edge here, it's hard to see because of the fence. This is a straight line that intercepts the fuselage. And imagine a cone shape where you've got this big radius up here and a tiny little radius at the, at the front. So that whole shape from here to there blends together into a, a cone. You know, think of like a dunce hat. Um, and this was an attempt early on, there was a theory in the late 40s that was experimented with that this could be a very good way of producing lift supersonically. And the theory was, as the air flowed over the top of this and a shock wave was formed, there would be this low pressure region over this whole upper side of this wing. And by essentially tilting the wing forward, the theory was that low pressure would actually suck the airplane forward through the air. So this big drooping part here was just that. It was like a surface for that low pressure to, to reduce drag on the airplane. In general, that theory is correct. The problem is, is the, the methods at the time were not very well known. They were kind of theories and kind of made up. And even though the effect is real, the amount of curvature you need wasn't really known. So they were just kind of guessing at that. And basically every airplane that was made after this one had less and less of that curvature. <laughs> it didn't completely go away, because it is real. Even Concord has some of it, but this is the most extreme version of it, because this was one of the first airplanes that tried this, and they figured out that it wasn't quite right. So we, we looked at it on the Hustler. The Hustler has it, even the F-15 has it. Um, so almost any Delta, SR-71 certainly has it, Concord. Any Delta wing has probably some, some amount of this. Um, they sort of went extreme and then they started dialing it out. Yes, like every version of this they made after this had less and less. And as a perfect example is right here on the F-106, which is a new airplane, but it's essentially an upgrade of this airplane. And I don't know if you can see it, but it probably has half as much droop as this right here with essentially the same wing design. And even that was determined to be too much <laughs> once they started flying it. Okay, so there's one other interesting thing about this airplane, which I'm sure many of the listeners will have heard this story before. Um, and that's the beginnings of what's called area ruling. So when this airplane was first designed and built, it was designed to go Mach like 1.3 or something like that. When it first flew, it would not even go supersonic. They could basically go put it full throttle, wouldn't even break the sound barrier. And essentially the fuselage was putting out way more drag in the whole airplane, honestly, than, um, 
than was, was expected or was predicted. At the same time, there was a, a, a researcher at NACA, the, the research institute here in the USA, the kind of forerunner to NASA, that came up with this idea, it was called area ruling. And what that says is that as you move from the front of, to the back of the airplane, if you kind of make slices through the airplane, you'll get like this cross-sectional area. And to minimize supersonic drag, you want that cross-sectional area, the change of it to be as smooth as possible when, as you go from the nose to the tail. You don't want big abrupt changes. And it's the entire airplane. So you can imagine you start at the front, it's pretty good. You know, the nose is pointy, it kind of slowly gets bigger. The cockpit's pretty pointy, it slowly gets bigger as well. All of a sudden you get to the wing. So you've got this nice slender fuselage that has this cross sections that's just changing gently. You stick a wing on it, all of a sudden you start to get this big change of the cross sectional area. And then as soon as you get to the back of the wing and the back of the airplane, all of a sudden it starts to just go away again. So you get these two big bumps in this distribution that causes a lot of supersonic drag. So the way you solve that is anywhere you in that kind of distribution that you have too much area, you just got to take some away from somewhere. So if you look at this fuselage, you can kind of see in the shadow there, there's like a dip right above about the nine um, in the 393. And so that's the fuselage getting smaller in shape and then it actually starts to get larger again because that's right where the wing is at its max size and then as the wing gets smaller you want to make the fuselage larger again and even more so if you look at these i don't know what these are actually called um, this shape right here is exactly that as well the original f-102 did not have this so imagine this whole shape here it's kind of like a pointy nose it's a pointy tail to make that area change just as gradual as possible as it flows off the back of the airplane so this is what to the layman is the coke bottle this is the coke bottle exactly yeah. yep yep and so the original f-102 did not have this it wouldn't go supersonic they essentially redesigned the entire fuselage to put those shapes into it built a new one called it the f-102a which is what this model is and all of a sudden just that change which you can see is actually pretty subtle it's not mm. that big of a change but that made it go from high subsonic speed to like mach 1.25 or something and almost every supersonic airplane after this one has some, some amount of that. So think T-38, um, these days it's not as, as obvious. Like anything kind of F-14, F-16 on, it's really put into the original design of the airplane and how everything's laid out and they're just a lot more blended. But in these early ones, it's very obvious when you can see that. Okay, let's head around and have a look at the intakes on this one. Yeah. Because as we were saying before, before we realized I was on mute, and as this is my show, we can't be having that. <laughs> is on this one is where we start to see intakes where we would expect to see them today, which is either side of the fuselage, yeah, and of, of a shape that's kind of recognizable. Yes. So the big change in this airplane, and remember, these were contemporary airplanes. This was done at nearly the same time as the F-100. The big difference on this airplane was its uh, fire control system, which included a big radar. So I think this is the first US Air Force jet that had a big radar in the nose as an original design feature into the airplane. Um, when you do that, you can no longer put your intake up here. So you've got to come up with a different intake design like this. And so this is actually a similar intake design to the F-100, and that's a pitot inlet, relatively sharp edge, um, and one on each side that comes together in a bifurcated duct that feeds together before it hits the engine. And we've got a boundary layer splitter again, just like before, on the P-80, that's ejecting this low energy airflow down and up, and I think some of this actually goes into the fuselage for cooling purposes as well. Yeah, there is, I'm not sure if this is gonna show it, but that dark bit in there, dear viewer, is, that in inlet within an inlet. My countryman going off again. So when we're starting to see this sort of design come in, one of the things that we always talk about on modern aircraft is how the inlet's designed for power. So that's what we were talking about before, minimizing the shock waves on it, getting as much clean air going through. Yep. What's noticeable here we go. Are we going to do 105? Or we, we, gonna... we, we, yes, we're going to do 104, 105. Because um, I'm just thinking numbers, because we're on 102, 102. That's a 106. Yep. Which order do you want to go? Um, it's up to you. We can go chronological or. Let's go chronological. Okay, so let's okay. go to 104. And while we're walking, let's talk about 103. Yes, what happened to the 103? I love this story. It's, it's, it's just classic overstretching. So, again, I said the Century Series were essentially a, a, a blank checkbook. Actually, 
Where is the 104? <laughs> we need to walk in the right direction. Oh, I think it's on the other side. Let's uh -huh. walk over here. Um, so many airplanes, ladies yes. and gentlemen, that were spoilt for choice. So the F-103 is the, the famous missing Century Series. There is no F-103 that was ever built. And so, like I said, this was the Wild West of airplane development with essentially an empty or a blank check. And I, it's slipping me now who built the F-103, or was proposing the F-103. Um, I think it was Republic, but don't quote me on that. So anyway, the F-103 was, was projected to be a Mach 3 fighter, if you can imagine that. <laughs> so here we have the F-102 that won't even go supersonic on his first flight. And, and they're already proposing. And they're proposing Mach 3. They just, this is just nobody knew what they were doing, and they were just out of control. Um, so they quickly figured out that Mach 3 is really hard for a lot of reasons. <laughs> there was no engine even close to being capable. They did not understand how to make engine inlets. They didn't understand the airframe heating that would go on. And so I think a mock-up was built of the F-103, but it never went past there. So. so once again, we're back at Lockheed. Yep, back at Lockheed. And we are with an aircraft with an interesting reputation. Yes. I think you're referring to it being called the Widowmaker. That would be it, yes. <laughs> yes. So before we get to that, let's talk about <laughs> the wing design. So we talked about the F-100 well, well, being- hang on, what yes. wing? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to see here. So F-100 being a relatively conventional swept wing, F-102 being a delta wing, now we have another radical departure on a supersonic wing design that actually worked reasonably well, actually very well for high speed. Not so much for slow speed, and we'll get to that in a second. So this is a wing with very little sweep, so the, it's hard to see here if you're not looking straight down, but this has like 20 degrees of sweep, you know, less than half of the sweep, uh, leading edge sweep of the other airplanes we're talking about. It turns out you can actually make a really decent wing with very little sweep and make it go supersonic if it's really sharp. And I don't know if you can see how sharp this is. You could almost cut yourself on this wing. Like it's not razor sharp, but it's it's really sharp. Like there is no radius there, right? Like you yeah. could you could split wood with this wing easily. <laughs> um, and it's solid. I don't know what material that is, but it's solid. Like you literally could split logs with this wing. And its overall thickness is really thin as well. Like in the middle of this wing, this wing is probably only like this thick. Um, so what happens here is. The, the, what we were talking about with wing sweep and, and the angles or the vortex lift and so forth, like you just throw all that out the window. And we have a really sharp leading edge. You get a shock wave here, but this leading edge is so sharp, the shock wave doesn't really add much drag. Mm -hmm. So you can actually make a decent high speed wing really simply like this. And, and Kelly Johnson figured that out. Of like, we're not going to throw all that crazy stuff. We're just going to put a really sharp leading edge on it and it's going to be good. And it was um, until you tried to fly slow. <laughs> <laughs> Which is an important aspect in two phases of flight. Yes, <laughs> two very important phases of flight, yes. So, a couple things. First of all, very similar time frame. I think this one came a year after those two. It was certainly in development at the same time. This airplane actually goes Mach 2 on, on essentially the same thrust engine. It is a different engine. This is a J79, whereas those had J57s. But same amount of thrust, goes Mach 2. The, that one barely did Mach 1, and same with the F100. So it was just a phenomenal design for its time. And so there's a couple secrets to why this airplane was able to go that fast. This wing is certainly one of them. If you look at the size of this wing, this wing is a tiny wing. So it's not producing much drag once it goes fast. And the whole airplane was kind of like that. Um, the whole airplane is just small to minimize surface area and minimize drag. Uh, the other secret on this is the inlet, but we'll talk about that in a second because right where you're at is a great place to talk about the low speed. So a wing like this with that sharp leading edge is a terrible low speed airplane. So as the air flows over that sharp leading edge, it just wants to stall. It, it doesn't want to do anything good once you start to go slow. So this airplane had a really high landing speed. The other interesting thing this thing had, which is you really can't see these features, but there's a big wing flap here. When this wing flap folded down, there's actually a slot right here that opens up and they took engine bleed air and blew that out of that slot. So it's called what, that's what's called a blown flap. So by energizing that flow, it takes the whole airflow over the wing and makes it want to stay stuck a little bit better and let it fly um, at, a, at a slower speed. So it's okay. a really neat idea and it actually worked really good until your engine quit. <laughs> so if you were on a landing uh, descent approach profile and your engine quit, I think the standard procedure in this airplane was to eject. I think it basically could not land without some engine power to keep that blown flap. Um, the problem with this airplane is the original ones had a downward 
ejecting ejection seat like many airplanes of this vintage. It was because those early generation ejection seats didn't have the big powerful rockets they have today and there was a lot of worry, especially at higher speeds, if you eject it up, you were gonna go straight through that tail. And then at that point, it's like, what's the point of ejecting? Yeah. So eject it down. The problem is, is in this airplane, most of the time you needed to eject was when you were coming in the land, which is when you exactly do not want to be ejecting down. Yes. So to put it to put it very mildly. Yes. Now, so the, sorry, I was going to say, I I'm intrigued on the inlet on this. Yes. Because so, basically we are looking at an engine with a pilot strapped to the front and a couple wings on it. That's yeah. essentially what the, yeah. the Starfighter is. The intakes of, to me have always seemed relatively small for what they need, but they do have a very interesting conical addition. Yes. They, they started to have a little bit of magic going on that all inlets after this were going to have, at least on, on high speed, high supersonic airplanes. So we talked about the pitot inlet before where the air comes in, there's a normal shock wave in here and the air slows down and, and goes into the engine. Works great at low supersonic speed. Once you get up to like Mach 1.5, 1.6 or higher, that style doesn't work very well because you're gonna lose too much energy going through that shock wave. So this is what's called an axis symmetric, or some people call it a spike inlet. And what happens here is the air as it starts to come in here actually deflects a little bit, but just a little bit, not, not, a, not a big sharp change. And what that does is makes what's called an oblique shock. So we were talking about normal shocks earlier. Normal means it's square. Oblique means it's at an angle. So you get this conical shock wave right here that the air has basically goes through that it also slows down, but it does so with a lot less energy loss. So that's really one of the really big secrets on why this airplane would go Mach 2, is because it could get air to its engine losing, I don't know, probably 10 or 20% of its energy versus if this was those inlets trying to go Mach 2, you're gonna lose like half of your energy and have half of your thrust at those speeds. So essentially we're turbocharging the air coming in. Essentially, in yes, that's a great way to put it. You're, you're, you're turning more of that energy into pressure as opposed to temperature, because you can pressure, you get the energy back, temperature is just wasted. It yeah. just makes everything hot. And this is a very unique design as well, because this inlet has no moving parts. It just has this fixed spike and it, doesn't work great at Mach 2 or at Mach 1. It's actually designed somewhere in the middle, like Mach 1.4. You're starting to lose a little at those two ends, but they're not far enough away to make much difference. When we get to later designs, you start to see moving parts here that actually change their shape depending on what speed you're going. So you're trying to maximize that energy or reduce that energy loss, maximize the efficiency over a much wider range of speeds. So most famously on Concorde with the veins in there, yep. and Concord then again veins. with the yep. spike on the SRS-72. Yep. 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 And then you can get even more complicated than that, like the F-111 has very no, complicated yeah. parts that are moving with a, a, a rounded shape like we this. We don't like talking about the F-111. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> right, so that's F-104. That's F-104. Which is a fascinating aircraft. We, it is. We're, we're always hard, hard on it, but it's, it's taking that cutting edge and that leading edge and turning it up to 11. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, the other interesting thing about this airplane, I think it was the first airplane that used the, and I forget the nomenclature, but the uh, 20 millimeter six barrel Gatling oh, gun. Oh, the Vulcan. The Vulcan, Vulcan yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's essentially on every airplane since, at least every American mm -hmm. airplane since. And so this was the first one to use that, um, which is kind of fascinating. Again, this airplane was so ahead of its time when you compare it to the contemporaries over here. Again, far from perfect. <laughs> and, and actually this airplane, because of that wing, was a terrible dogfighter. It actually got a pretty bad reputation, but what it became was an interceptor yeah. where you're not really dogfighting anymore. You're, you're really, you need something you can scramble and you can get up to altitude and go really fast to go warn off Soviet bombers or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it was great for that. But if you got in a turning fight with another airplane, not so yeah. much. Because you're, you're into a part of the flight envelope where those wings can't really yeah, do they, anything. They're they too, can't too produce, sharp. There's no. Yeah. There's no curv yep. curvature. There's no camber. Camber. There we That's go. right. That's and it. leading edge radius. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so we'll talk quickly about the F-106. It's um, it's really an upgrade of the F-102 that we just talked about. It is a new airplane. There's actually a lot of subtle details. Standing back and looking at it, it looks pretty similar. It's about mm -hmm. the same size, same weight does have a much upgraded engine. So it has the J75, I think, which is like 50% more thrust. Probably its biggest feature is, um, and you can, first of all, you can see how much bigger this inlet is. Mm -hmm. When we were over there on the F-102, A, it was down here, and it was only like this big. So this thing has got like twice the area. 
now we're starting to get into moving parts. So this, this airplane, I think, came in 1955, if I remember right, so like three or four years after the F-102. And as you can see, this hinge line here. So this is much like Concorde. Concorde was more square, but this ramp moves up and down um, at different flight speeds, at different supersonic speeds to optimize the angle of that oblique shock wave and just really maximize the efficiency through a much wider range. Subtle differences, but giving big jumps forward in performance. Big jumps, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and there was a lot of research going into intakes during that, yeah. that time frame. Right, so we're cracking along now. Cracking along. So let's talk about the F-105. Now, I have a soft spot for the F-105, so <laughs> go, 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 go gently on it. Oh, I, I like the F-105 as well. Um, it's, it's, it's a big brute. I mean, it's, yeah, it is a big airplane. So it actually has the same engine that, that the F-106 has. Uh, relatively conventional wing. It's kind of back to the F-100 wing design, just, a lot of sweep, but pretty traditional wing. Um, very area ruled. I don't know if you can see this, but the, the fuselage kind of necks down where that wing's at, and then it does like flare out towards the back. Mm -hmm. So the area ruling was a big deal. And actually, if you look from the top, which we can't, it's even more pronounced. Right. It gets really Coke bottle kind of right in that middle part. So this airplane was not really designed as a fighter. It's, you know, it's called the F-105, but it really was a fighter bomber. So it, it was really for hauling a lot of ordnance and, and, and dropping it. Um, certainly could, could turn and so forth as well, probably better than an F-104. So it's a big airplane. I think this airplane holds the record of being the largest single engine jet ever built. Like it's a big, heavy airplane, but really good performance. I think it also does Mach 2. Um, part of that is just the big engine. Again, it has 50% more thrust than the the F-104 and, and, engine. And it's very clean, because it's got it's very clean. Inter internal Bombay, very, yep. very little hanging off the wings. Yeah. Um, this, this one's got the, this is a wild weasel, isn't it? So it's got the Shrike uh, rail on it. Um, yeah. So. And this inlet, I actually love this inlet. So this is a bifurcated inlet again. So two inlets, one on each side, coming together to feed the engine. But it's kind of backwards from what you're used to seeing. So most inlets like this, the long part, is on the fuselage and then it slopes away from the airplane as it goes back. This thing you can see is inverted. And what I like about this is when we were talking about those ramped inlets, they're actually turning the air as they go past the inlet. And that's kind of the secret on how it gets down. Once it's inside the fuselage, they gotta turn it back the other way okay. to get it to the engine. Let's sneak around to the shady side. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We might be able to see that was very yeah. shadowy when you were doing your hand waving. Yep. There we go. And we'll keep tripping over the... <laughs> yeah. uh, so yeah, so we, this shot's great. So we, yeah. we, you can see that very sharp, sharp cut in. So, so this is turning the air to slow it down, but it's actually turning it in the direction that you want it to go. You want it to go in the fuselage, not out. So by flipping this inlet over, it's going exactly where you want it to go. So I think that's another secret. I think that single turn, and then they've got to turn it back, but they don't have to turn it back as much as if it was turned around. I think that makes the air, again, getting into the engine even more efficient. This one you can't really see here because they've got it blocked off to keep the critters out, but this has moving parts inside of it as well. So you can kind of see the curved part there. There's a curved ramp that slides inside there that moves forward and aft to change the geometry uh, as it goes through that speed range. And all of that's automatic. So as, as the pilot dials in. Yes, as far as I know, I don't know that any of these have like a controllable inlet ramp. I think there's crude, you know, analog computers that are sensing, hey, this is the, the condition yeah. outside. I'm going to put the, the ramps in this position, and it's all automatic. This is where we need Russ Violet, because that one, I think, is one of his. Ah. So who we interviewed last time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Him. So, yeah, I, for, for all the jokes of it, the thud, <laughs> she is, she's an absolute beast. Oh, and yeah. she can take a beating. Yeah. Well, and, Republic aircraft. Well, exactly. Yeah. I actually like, that's one of the things I like to talk about is there's so much lineage within aircraft companies during this time frame. So you look at like the airplanes that they made in World War II, you look at this era and what they made in Vietnam, and they all kind of follow a similar philosophy to themselves that's somewhat different. So, you know, you look at, think of a P-51, an F-86, and an F-100 are different in performance, but the kind of same mission, kind of design philosophy, just being simple, clean airplanes, very maneuverable, great fighters, you know, maneuverable dog fighters and so forth. This, obviously made by Republic, is the kind of the incarnation of the uh, P-47 in much the same way. A much larger airplane than its contemporaries, much more brutish, much more survivable, can carry more, and so same thing. And then of course where it goes from there is you get the A-10. Right, so same company, same philosophy. So P-47, F-105, A-10, like 
all, all, all brothers, right? Happy days. Happy days. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I think, I think F-107 is the only thing left. So before we head inside, hmm? we have looked at an incredible group of fighters, all within about 100 yards of each other here at Pima Air and Space. And we've seen from the drawing board, what? A difference of, so that's for seven years. Yeah. So the, de the design philosophy of these one, two, three, four companies that we've looked at is just jumping forward in yeah. all the time. Yes, okay, we've got a different mission type here with the, the thud, but very sharp period of time and quite drastic changes in just the shape and the development just, just of the philosophy. aircraft. Yeah. yeah. We're now going to go see one that didn't make it. Right. But it's pretty special. Yes. Right, so we've come inside, thank goodness, and we have North American's folly and a very different approach to just about everything. So let's talk F-107. Yeah, so I'll be honest, I know less about this airplane than the others, probably because it never went into service. For good um, reason, look at it. Yes, yes. <laughs> and it, so there's not as much information on it, and there's not one at my local air museum back home, so I'm not used to talking about this airplane. Um, I think the way you explained this was this was North American's attempt to make a much higher performance airplane without completely starting over. So mm. there's a lot of common elements here to the F-100 Super Sabre. I don't know how many actual common parts there are. It might be one of those cases where there's like none. But if you look at the fuselage shape, um, the wing, the tail, both tails, like there's a lot of family resemblance here to the F-100. And so I think the big problems they were trying to solve here, one is how to get a bigger engine into it. Secondly, radars were a thing at this point, and I don't remember exactly what year this was, but probably mid to late 50s. Radar was very much a thing. You had to get a radar into an airplane. So this pedo inlet on the nose doesn't work anymore, nor does a pedo inlet work for the kind of speeds they're trying to get here. I believe, if I remember right, this was trying to get up to like the Mach 2 range to compete with the F-104 and so forth. So if you're gonna try to stick with the same airframe, you gotta put the inlet somewhere. And for whatever reason, they decided to stick them on top of the fuselage, <laughs> which theoretically works just fine. Um, this inlet's kind of interesting. It's, it's a, a style of inlet that's much like what we get eventually on the uh, F-15 or the, even the, the F-4 or the F-106 we just saw, but it's two stuck together. Um, and so basically that's a way to get uh, the, the ramp system, which you can kind of see in there, that hinge line, get that in there for variability at various mock speeds, but get it in a thing in a, in a location where that inlet's not stuck on the side of the fuselage. Uh, why they chose to do that and not just stick it on the side of the fuselage, I don't know that answer. <laughs> and I suspect this would have been a more successful airplane if they had just done that. So I, I suspect, again, it was back to the, let's save as much as we can from the fuselage. And if you start to put a, a different inlet duct through the side walls, you're very much changing the structure of that fuselage. So. I don't know, I, I don't have a better answer for you. But um, what is interesting about the inlet is that is the configuration that ended up being on um, the, the uh, Valkyrie. So uh, the Valkyrie inlet looks very much like that. It's underneath the wing instead of on top of the fuselage, but it looks darn near identical to that. So the two big problems with this, one is um, air tends to accelerate faster over the top of airplanes, so kind of the way the way wings work and fuselage shapes and so forth. And so inlets below the airplane where the, air, the full is naturally being slowed down is just a better place to put them on, on top. That probably is not that big of a penalty, but it certainly doesn't help. Then the obvious problem here is ejection, is getting out of the airplane past that inlet that is literally right behind your head. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know the exact history. I don't think any of these ever crashed, I don't think, because I think there's only two of them built. I think, maybe three. There's one in the Air Force Museum in Dayton, there's one here, and I think that might be the only two that were ever built. Um, and looking at the wing, it's, there's nothing too I, drastic I to it than we've already discussed. Very similar, if not identical, to an F-100 wing. So, we're gonna jump onto the thing behind you in a second, <laughs> but what was the legacy of the Century Series? Because the Century Series is kind of something that historians have made up and, and, and stuff. It wasn't advertised as such. No, right. I don't know when that name was actually coined, but probably after the yeah. fact. Yeah, so the, so the legacy of this is, is it's not surprising, but it's also kind of disappointing. So it was this like 
what I call the old west <laughs> for almost a decade where there was like blank checks to be written. There was a lot of development, a lot of development did happen. Like there was so much that was learned on each of these airplanes. And again, they were good enough to put them in service. Most of them only stayed in service for a couple years. Um, the, you know, the, the exceptions are the F-104, I think are still flying somewhere in the world, I think. Maybe not. Probably. Uh, anyway, but, but most of them only lasted for a few years. The F-100 did last through Vietnam, so it had a life of, what was that, 10 or 15 years. But as a... So it was in guards regiments for a long yeah, time. Yeah, as a different type of an airplane, yeah. not as a frontline fighter. So uh, anyway, there was a lot of learning, like inlets, materials, control systems, aerodynamics, all of that just like went massive strides. And not just the Century Series, of course. The Navy was doing their own thing, Great Britain, France, Russia, like every country was doing the same thing at the same time and learning from one another and so forth. In the U.S., the, the Department of Defense, at the time run by Nat McNamara, was kind of getting tired of writing blank checks. <laughs> so he came at the end of this decade and said, okay, aerospace companies, in the next decade, in 1960s, I want one airplane. So not one a year, not one per service, I want one airplane. So you all work together, you give us, you know, give me some, some competitors. By the way, Navy and Air Force, I said one airplane, you all have got to share it. <laughs> so you all work together and figure out the requirements. And that's essentially what came out as the F-111, which has, has, people have mixed opinions of, most of them not so positive, <laughs> because to me it was a compromised design. It was too much trying to do what the Air Force wanted and the Navy wanted, and if they're like, okay, if we only get one airplane this decade, we've got to put everything in it we ever wanted. You know, every performance feature, a brand new engine, every avionics upgrade, et cetera. And it just kind of turned into what we now think of as bloated military programs that take 10 or 20 years. And then at the end, you still get an airplane with whatever performance. So unfortunately in the 60s, everything we just talked about stopped <laughs> and you got one airplane. And then actually you got two. Eventually the Navy separated, convinced whoever that this really didn't work for them so you get the F-14. But then you got to really fast forward into the 70s before you get to the F-15 and the F-16. So yeah, vast, vastly different change in development procedure. And I think the industry got less innovative because of that. Mm -hmm. Now, we've spent a lot of time talking about inlets, and as we're stood here, we can't let <laughs> the Blackbird and the drone go yes. without, because as you pointed out, there's some very interesting subtleties on the inlets of these aircraft. Yes. Quick shot of the Kiowa, because why not? Right. So if you want a full rundown of both the SR-71 a12, YF12, and the D21. See our chat with Paul Crickmore, right. which was a lot of fun. But we're going to be focusing in on these beasts. Yes, yeah, so obviously this story about this inlet has been told many times, including on your recent podcast, which was excellent. If you haven't watched it, go watch it or listen to it. It's, it's great. Thank, thank you. That's very kind of you to say. Yes. <laughs> So I'll, I'll cover this really briefly. What I really want to talk about is the D21 inlet in comparison, because it's pretty interesting. So this is much like the inlet we looked at on the F-104, sort of, um, in that it's a, an axis symmetric or a spike inlet. As the air flows over it, you get this oblique shock that slows the air down as it goes into that annular ring. So the big difference is this is the, the, the full dimensional version of that, not cut in half on the side of a fuselage. That spike actually moves in and out, and it's hard to see the details, but inside that um, inner lip of that cowl, it tapers down, and as this spike moves in and out, that area, the cross-sectional area there changes. So it can optimize what kind of airflow it's getting uh, for the speeds that it's going. And then there's some complicated stuff going on in there. You can't really see it because it's all black, but there is a boundary layer bleed in there. I think there's one on the cone as well. Um, that gets passed out through some struts back in there. So there's a lot of magic going on inside that inlet. And then of course, when this thing gets really fast, a lot of the air bypasses the core of the engine and turns into a ramjet. And again, your previous podcast covered that quite well. So, so that's that. So the interesting thing to look at here is, look at the shape of this inlet and it is a cone. So meaning the lines on it are straight. Um, we come over to the D21. So this is a very similar design, but it's different. So it's this axisymmetric spike again. But notice we talked about the, the SR-71 having straight lines. This has a straight cone right here, 
and then it's got this curved surface. And this curved surface is really important because what happens here, instead of just getting one oblique shock right here, you do get that with a straight section, but then you get a series of a whole bunch of tiny little oblique shocks along this curve. And so this thing is really maximized for one speed. And that's why this is different, is because this drone was carried on top of the aircraft up to, I don't remember what its launch speed was, but something close to Mach 3 likely. This thing never had to take off. <laughs> this thing never had to produce thrust on the ground on a runway. So they could exactly optimize this shape exactly for this airplane at essentially one speed. It only ever had to fly one speed. And that's what you get with this curved shape. If you did this on the Blackbird, it would probably go quite a bit faster, but it would not be able to take off. So fixed, no moving parts, really simple, but optimized for a single speed. And didn't work. And had its own issues. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, Joe, thank you so much. Yes. That was absolutely fascinating. We've done the Century Series and thrown in a bit of yeah. Mark III technology as well. Exactly. Fantastic. So this is maybe what the F-103 would have been. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I cannot thank Joe enough for his time. You know, he'll probably say that he was quite happy to hang out. But honestly, to pick his brains and ask stupid questions of someone who genuinely knows what they're talking about when it comes to aerodynamics, aircraft design, was a real treat. So thank you, Joe. He will be back. He's great. But Joe is also a damn Kastir, which is one of our supporters on Patreon. So for just £3 a month, plus a bit of VAT on the bottom tier, you too can become a patron and support the pod get these podcasts early, join in on our chats. We've been chatting about famous random airplanes in movies. There's a lot of them. It's been fun. And of course, we get our Zoom socials going as well. We've had some fab guests so far too. So do check us out at patreon.com forward slash the Damcasters for more information there. As always, check out Pima they're incredible and they're going to be continuing their sponsorship of the pod for the foreseeable too, which is great. So we look forward to whatever fantastic stuff we've got coming up with them next. Join us again soon. We're going to be back. I'm working on a few things which sort of shorter bonusy episodes as well may include typhoons and rockets. You never can tell. So do the like and subscribe thing. Put some stars into your podcast app of choice. If you can leave us a review, that would be great because that helps our algorithmic overlords to push these things up into the charts, which is always a lovely thing to happen. Thank you ever so much for your continued support. And until next time, do take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.